Well, I guess I'd like to start, actually, with a question for both of you. Can you hear me all right? Um, with a question for both of you, which is, um, how did you begin working together? How did, how did Julie's work come to your attention? Um, Julie's work came to me, her wonderful agent, Nicole Faraji. Uh -huh. um, the great letter, which I actually reread oh, today, yeah, one, of, one of the things the letter said was, um, don't you dare um, think of this as a collection of stories. This is a magnificent novel, which, you know, it is, and it was, but it was, it was, it was very, um, it was a very compelling letter, and then I read the first chapter, and it was completely dazzled, and I think I emailed, we hadn't met, but I think I emailed Nicole right away, and then I emailed you. If you, yeah, yeah. You got, I got the email shortly after you. Yeah. But we hadn't met. No, uh, no, no, I've been years. But it was very quick. I mean, I, I, I read the book, and I, I, I was so um, knocked out of my seat by it. It was very yes. clear, of course, yeah. You knew immediately that you wanted. Why? What exactly made you want it? Uh, one of the things that I think is so um, remarkable about Julia's work is the precision of her sentences. Just on a you know sentence by sentence basis, they're so um, exquisitely crafted and labored over and, and, um, and you know, crystalline and just, you know, I, it, 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 so I was dazzled by the language and, um, and completely taken in by the story. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have um, very few, uh, no one has writers like this. <laughs> it's extraordinary. So what happened when you met? You then arranged a meeting? Well, actually, I mean, we met years before when my first book came out. I remember, and, and Jordan, you know, went, you know, read that manuscript, and at that point we hadn't met, but I remember, um, and I didn't know anything about you, so um, I remember talking to my agent, and then she said um, that I should uh, speak to another one of her writers, who was Nathan Englander, and so I called Nathan right away, and he just raged. Did you know Nathan then? I, we knew each other. I, I'm a regular at the Hungarian pastry shop, which is the cafe <laughs> up, up near um, Columbia, right near the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And so I've been going there for about 20 years since before I began to write even. And Nathan and I had been introduced uh, years ago and then just never spoke again. We were just introduced by, you know, by a, a, his sister's friend. And then, um, and then for about maybe six or seven years, we never spoke. And then, um, when I got the call, I, I called him. I called him up on his cell phone. He, he just, I think he just came back from Israel, and he answered. Um, and we met that evening um, uh, at the cafe, and he just besmirched me completely. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> you know, he he really raised. So um, that, and then I think we had lunch um, yeah, shortly sure. thereafter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we didn't see. Him. I think it was for a long, long time. Years. Yeah. It's very interesting that you mentioned Nathan. He and Julia are very different kinds of writers, but there's what it, there's. I see some some something that would attract you as an editor that shared with them. What do you think? There's virtuosity. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not. I mean, are you thinking because of it, it, um, Well, I'm curious to know. His attention to the sentence, his attention yes. to the detail of language, his attention, like Julie, to the sound of language. Is Absolutely. Really but also, thematically, the, um, the idea of straddling worlds, mm -hmm. being an outsider mm -hmm. and an insider at the same time. That's mm -hmm. so true. Mm -hmm. Is that something generally that interests you in your, in, as you build a list? That my own interests are very broad and eclectic, and I, I can't really put them into any single compartment. It, 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 it's always my, my my initial interest um, is just always ignited by the language mm -hmm. and by the voice and the sense of vitality on the page. And then you know, if, I mean, if the voice is um, commanding, then I you know I will follow it anywhere. So Julie, after that conversation with Nathan, do you have a sense of what kind of an editor Jordan was? Were you expecting um, a certain thing? Actually, I, no, I had no idea. And I never, I mean, it was my first book, so I never worked with an editor before, so I really, I didn't know what to expect. So 
so I just, but I went, I think I went into it very trusted. I just felt like, okay, you know, I'm being placed in good hands and I just have to have faith. But I, I really didn't know at all what to expect. So after that first meeting, did you then um, um, do a letter about the book? Well, I have to tell you. I have been thinking about this night with some anxiety because you're trying to remember. No, I remember everything very vividly, and I have sorted through 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 our correspondence and the files. But the fact is that truly, no one has ever needed an editor less than Julie. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really about like, what will we talk about? You know, I have other writers where I could say, you know, and then I, you know, in my third 10 page single spaced editorial letter, we said, let's take out this entire plot line and, you know, change the. But no, you know, I mean, my conversations with Julia, our exchanges are really down to the level of, you know, are you sure you need this modifier in the last <laughs> sentence? <laughs> Maybe this should be a period instead of a semicolon. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, there's very little. Um, she doesn't really think. But everything that you've said, I mean, every suggestion that you've made, it's pretty much been all right on. Just, if it's a word here or a word there, or just take out this last sentence, you know, from the last paragraph of this chapter, it's like, it'll just, you know, we'll think, it'll just, you know. It, I agree with everything that you said. Even even if there weren't a lot of <laughs> the comments that you did make, felt right on. That's so well. Um, Someone, I think it was actually Nan Graham when she did an author and editor that we just honored Nan Graham with our Perkins Award, said she feels there are two kinds of approaches to editing. One is that you have the sort of macro shape of the book and you work down from there. The other is you just are, you enter the book because of the sentences and you work up from there. In general, which of those are you? Or do you do I both? think it's specific and, to the book. And, I mean, it's, and, with, and which is it with Julie? Or do you mostly on the large shape of the book or mostly on the fine tuning? Julie delivers a manuscript. She has been polishing it and refining it. And it, it arrives on my desk nearly you know, a final draft. It just does. It comes to me in a very different state than most of the writers I work with, many of whom you know, deliver chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. or section by section. This is, um, you know, Julie delivers, she works alone for many years, and then the manuscript comes to you in this um, astonishingly polished form, so. And, and do you work alone? Do you, have a, do you have a trusted reader that you show things to Actually, early on? I do, and I, I usually, when I finish a chapter, I pass it on to my agent, Nicole, so she's usually the first reader. Um, mm -hmm. And I just really, I really trust her judgment. Mm -hmm. um, but I pretty much, I mean, when I'm in the middle of working on a chapter or a story, I don't show it to anyone. I mean, I think of it as being inside the egg. I mean, it's just this, I need to be in a very protective kind of womb-like space, and I, I can't be, I can't hear anything too negative or jarring while I'm working on something. After I, I feel like it's done, and it's exactly the way I want it to be, and I put it out in the world, and I'm open to any sort of criticism when I can hear it. But while I'm in the middle of something, I, I don't like getting a lot of feedback. I just need to stay my head. I, I could be wrong, but I think this is the first book that I've read that's in the first person plural. Is it the first book? That the Virgin Suicide. I didn't read that. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Should I be admitting that? No, it's I didn't, great. I it's didn't great. read it's it. It's a great book. I read Middle Sex. <laughs> I haven't read the new one either. Um, Joshua Ferris, and then they came to the end, which I've not read. Is it the first book you've edited? Oh yes, absolutely. And you know, I mean, if you had, um, if, if 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 you had suggested it to me as an idea, I would have been daunted by it in theory because it's such a difficult thing to take on and to make, to, to bring um, emotional immediacy to it when you have a collective voice. But of course, it's you know, it's executed so beautifully that you just are taken in. It does work beautifully, but were you, did you have a moment's hesitation about that, or did you know from, as the idea was forming, that was the way to do it? Uh, well, I mean, I actually tried writing for a while from the point of view of just one picture ride, but it just felt flat and wrong, and I mean, I found so many fascinating stories in my research, and I wanted to leave them all in, so I remember just looking for pages and pages of just notes that I'd written, and then I just saw 
this one line, which is now the first line of the novel, but on the boat we were about to see virgins. And when I saw that line, I thought, aha, that's a great first line. Maybe that voice would be the voice that would allow me to just to tell everyone's story. But once I you know, decided to use that voice, it was actually really fun. I mean, I, it was almost like a joyous voice. It was, it, there was something that means. Oh, good. I mean, there's something very song-like. And, yeah, I, I just, I, it was a very, I, I, it, it, didn't, it didn't feel constricting at all. It felt like it, it allowed me to tell a much bigger story than I could have told otherwise. And it was, it was fun. It was a really fun voice to work in. Tell me a little bit about the process in-house um, where you um, sell the novel within your house or advocate well, or be an advocate. You know, I mean, it, it, speaking specifically about Buddha in the Attic, um, this was a joy because we had published When the Emperor's Divine, which had been um, quite successful mm -hmm. as a hardcover. Um, it had you know, really terrific sales in hardcover, beautiful reviews, but then in paperback, had been course adopted all across America and um, had had um, sold, by the time I was pitching this in house, um, when the emperor was divine, it sold more than 200,000 copies in paperback quietly in a sort of under the radar way so that no one really, if you, unless you were studying this, you know, many people didn't realize that in the, in the years, in, in the intervening years, this had become, emperor had become a quiet phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So that's a wonderful, Piece of information to bring to, you know, your colleagues, and um, and then you know, and I was coming to them with this, with, with this very special book. So my job was really remarkably straightforward. I mean, there were there were ample opportunities to um, to create problems. You know, if we hadn't put such a beautiful jacket on the book, that would have been a problem. Um, but but it was a very um, smooth, exciting, electric process. There was great excitement about having a new work from Julie after many years. There was a, a you know, strong conviction that it would be um, prominently reviewed, that it would be a major critical success. And you know, we all have a feeling that um, it could be it, it could it could reach a, a, a very wide readership as well. And you know, that is really like the, the stars aligning you know, for our novel. So it was thrilling. It is a beautiful cover, and can you tell me a little bit about, um, I think there are probably a lot of people in the room who don't know how the cover is selected for a book and when, whether the author is part of that process or not. So could you both tell us a little bit? I'm curious, was this the first cover you saw? You said that there were seven versions before. <laughs> I didn't send them to you. You're right. So, and I don't know, I mean, was the parasol like a blue at one point? I heard that, but I never <laughs> saw any of the previous versions. Yeah, and there wasn't the suitcase initially. I mean, we went through many iterations. Um, I have another book right now, which I, 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 I won't mention the name of it, but where it's a wonderful book, and it's a first novel. But we are up to our 32nd jacket, uh, <laughs> of which the author has seen um, two. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's something you really care about a lot. It's worth getting it right. You know, it's the it's the biggest sales tool you have mm -hmm. for a book. Mm -hmm. So I happen to think that this, this came out very very well. Mm -hmm. And and the, one of the other things, are you involved at all in getting the blurbs for the book, or is that? You? And what's that process like? Usually hideous. <laughs> 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 I think it's a terrible process. I wish we could abolish it. Actually, I don't know. I just think that you know, it, it's it's as a as an editor, um, as as um, passionately as I want to champion my own writers, I also um, am, am a, a great advocate for for all great writers, and I, the idea of taking great writers away from their own work, which I seem to be constantly trying to do. You know, uh, you know, apologizing profusely for asking them to divert their attention in order to. So uh, it's a terrible process. I wish there was a better way of um, convincing consumers and booksellers that you, know, you have something really important. But it's, when you have a really great um, writer, especially someone who's making a debut, 
Okay. You're a, you must be on the other end of that now, asked to blur other people's thoughts. Oh, yeah, I've been asked to blur with you. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, I mean, it's, I mean, I feel like, see, that makes me so mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you're right. Um, but I mean, I was so grateful, you know, by the blurbs that I got from my first book, that it's like you want to turn around and, yeah. and give somebody else a helping hand. So, I mean, I did a few that were all for first time novelists. They were all debut books, um, and I feel like it. I mean, I feel like karmically, it's, it's a way of I getting back. Either. So yes, I I always feel very bitterly actually when a writer who's been, especially one who who has been helped by okay. endorsements, when when they say, well, I have a policy, and I think, well, you know, you needed someone not to have a policy for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, can you tell me a little bit, um, Julie, about um, well, there was a there was a long period of time between you two both. So can you say that? That's cool. um, yeah. And and um, what is your writing process like? Why did you take that time? And and um, how how many years was it? Eight years? It's been nine years since the first book came out. But I think I started writing it about a year after. Um, so it's been I would say it was eight years in the works. So didn't it take a couple of years after this book was finished to get it out? Actually, I we were, I was working on the book up until up through the summer, and then all of oh, a really? sudden it, it seemed like Ooh, it, all of a sudden it became this yeah. book in the world. I mean, it very happened fast, yeah. very very fast. So mm -hmm. I thought that was working until the very end. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I mean, my first book took almost six years. So I mean, I I I am just a slow writer. Period. But mm -hmm. this one took even longer because I had to do a lot of research about these two different worlds, I did, but I knew very little about. I mean, I know a little bit about World War II and the internment because my mother and my family, but I didn't know anything about picture brides or old Japan, the world from which these young women came, so. Um, but then you can get really carried away with the research, too. I mean, you have to know where to stop. I have just, you know, I have a lot of notebooks just filled with factoids. Um, but I think whenever you're writing historical fiction, though, you have, you have to get things right. Um, otherwise, someone will call you on it, so. Um, so I had to do my homework first, just mm -hmm. so I could feel confident enough to tell the story. And then at a certain point, you just try to forget everything and, mm -hmm. and just begin to write. But so it was the research, labor, very labor intensive. Plus, just my process. I'm just I could labor over a sentence for days, and I and I do. So and then just cut it out and won't make it to the final draft anyway. But it's you know I have to I give every word a lot of consideration and thought. And you were a visual artist first, mm -hmm. and you put that aside to write. Mm -hmm. um, as you did that, were there writers that you had in mind as role models or? Hemingway. Any kind of Hemingway. I was looking at a lot of Hemingway when I first started to write um, really? my first book. I was reading all of his short stories. So I was very influenced by his, well, especially the Nick Adams stories, the kind of tip of the iceberg. I mean, you have this character who's come back from horrific experience in the war, which is just kind of just glancingly, I mean, actually not, it's not even referred to, but I thought that would be a good way to tell my first book, just very quietly and not really hammer home the awfulness of the internment. It seemed unnecessary, so I think he was my big influence for my first book. And when and when you were a young editor, was there were there editors that were mentors to you or role models or that you really wanted, thought, I want to be an editor like that person? Nagram. Nancy was one of them. Uh -huh. um, yeah, many. Gary Fiskadon, who mm -hmm. you know is my great colleague. Um, Jerry Howard, mm -hmm. Morgan Entrican, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. from Perkins, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, a lot of those people have won our Perkins Award, and and I mean, a good number of them are your colleagues now yeah. right. at, at Knopf. Yeah, yeah. Knopf Doubleday, I think, has a large percentage of our Perkins Award winners. Yeah. Um, what do you think is, it seems as if, um, well, it doesn't seem as if, it is true that the book world and publishing is changing really rapidly, and um, what do you think are the challenges that an editor faces now that they didn't face five years ago, and what would you say to someone who um, is a young person who wants to be an editor? Yeah, it's changing. It's definitely changing. It's a funny moment to try to step outside of it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a it, it's a moment of such 
upheaval and contortion, and, and I think that um, uh, the, the, the consequences of you know, the whole evil revolution are still just beginning to become fully apparent. In terms of what I would say to a, a young person who wants to become an editor, I would say, you know, the form itself is, is um, so much less important than what is embodied in the form. I mean, whether they're e-books or they're hardcovers or they're paperbacks is, 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 is so much less essential than, um, than, than the stories themselves. And that won't change, ever. So um, on that level, I'm just not frightened. You know, there will always be great writers. There will always be a need for someone to fall helplessly in love with them. And, um, and my own view is that there is no better life than the editorial life. So, mm -hmm. uh, and also we need people in the business who are passionate and, and dedicated and, um, you know, and, and slightly irrational. <laughs> <laughs> And how about you, Julia, as you think about how your life as a writer has changed over the past several years, um, from the time when you were contemplating writing your first novel to now? Um, is there anything you could tell a young writer that would be a caution to them or a help to them? Um, I mean, I would say, I mean, you just really have to write the book that you want to write. And I would say, don't worry about the market. I mean, I, I had no idea when I was writing my first book. I mean, it didn't seem very marketable. It wasn't what I mean, my classmates when I was at Columbia weren't writing historical fiction. So I, you know, but it was just really a story that I was dying to tell. I and mean, I think if you, if you have a good story to tell and you tell it well, I, I do feel like it will find an audience. So I mean, I would just say be true to yourself and, and don't worry too much about what's going on out, on, out there, you know, in the world because things change so quickly anyway.